Can't smile about it. Man, this is good stuff. <laughs> Church Nampa. Everybody say, He is risen. And you say, He is risen indeed. Yes, praise the Lord. What a beautiful day He's given us to come together and to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the scriptures say in 1 Peter chapter 1 that we should be of this attitude. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. 
We have a living hope that we have been born into through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. And we have the opportunity today to praise Him together. We've, uh, we've been able to come outside. He gave us the sunshine and the, the sounds and the sights and the feels. And uh, as we see Easter uh, in the springtime, it's the perfect time to see all of the signs of life. Life bursting forth from the, the darkness and the cold of winter. And now the color and the life and the vibrancy and all of that is a parable to tell you of the life that God gives through Jesus Christ. So I just hope that you're soaking it all in. We're glad that you're here. Uh, my name is Anders. I'm one of the pastor elders here. And let me be the first to welcome you as we uh, share this time together. If you are new or visiting with us, we, we want to give you a special welcome. We're glad we could be together. Um, on the table in the back, if you would, before you leave, there's a, something we simply call a card. We would love to have you just share a little bit of contact information so we can know you and come alongside you and pray with you. There's a space for prayer requests on the back. And uh, we take those seriously. We bring them to the Lord as, uh, as pastors, as uh, shepherds of a flock. And so just want to invite you to do that uh, before you leave. And then let me share a couple of things that are going on in the coming days. Um, we do have a couple of events to know about, uh, some dates to mark. and just want to mention those before we get going. First of all, there's a couple things coming up now that we are in April. Uh, on the 17th of April, which is a Saturday, there's something called the Hope for the Journey Conference. And the Hope for the Journey Conference is uh, about adoption and caring for those that are in that process or those who are around it at all. And so uh, if you have any questions, the Hawkins family, can you raise your hands, Hawkins family? They're sitting right over here. You guys could talk to them. They've got all the details about that event. And then later in April, uh, we also have a special night coming on the 23rd of April, and uh, it's called Secret Church. And what that is, is uh, it's a live stream of David Platt teaching from the scriptures for a long period of time. So we're going to come together at the church. We're going to uh, stream that and join in together. We'll have food and snacks and things to kind of keep us going, but it's a deep dive into the scriptures and it's called Secret Church because it's based off of an exp the experience of the persecuted church who, when they come together, it's a big deal. And they want food. They want scripture. They want time together. And so just acknowledging that and seeing that, we're going to call upon our own hunger in the Word and spend some time together. So I invite you to just save those dates coming up. The last thing I would mention is that we do uh, have community groups going on throughout the week. And that's a chance to get past the service context and get into homes and build relationships and meet folks and spend time together. So if you haven't been a part of one of those and you've been hanging around, we'd love to invite you to take part. It's a, a meal shared together in a home, uh, the first hour, and then the second hour we open the Bible and it's just a discussion-oriented, um, conversation-oriented time. And so Wednesdays uh, from 6 to 8, there's a group. On Thursdays from 6 to 8, there's a group. There's also one on Wednesdays on Zoom from 6.30 to 8. So I invite you guys to uh, ask myself or Butch or Shauna about the details and we can get you connected. But we love to, as we say, make Jesus not ignorable in Nampa and to the ends of the earth. We do that by making joyful, passionate disciples. And then we have some values as a, as a church to worship God passionately, to connect authentically, which is what those groups are meant to help foster a beginning point for that. Uh, growing to know God deeply and then going and showing and telling the gospel boldly. That's Calvary Church Nampa. And as you're here this morning, especially that first one, this is our chance to worship God passionately. So let me invite you. We're going to say a word of prayer as we begin to tune your hearts to the goodness of God, to all his gifts of life and peace through Jesus, to look and think on that empty grave and let it fill you with joy that we might react in song and in praise and in prayer together today. So let's bow our heads and invite the Lord Jesus to bless this time with us. Father in heaven, what a miracle you have worked in defeating sin on the cross, and defeating death through an empty tomb. Today we praise your name. Today you are the star. Today we lift you high, that you be seen and recognized, that all the glory and honor be given to you and no one else. We love you and we praise you. You are King of kings and Lord of lords, a name that is above all other names. So God, we invite your stirring, your working through your living presence, through your spirit to be here with us, to be honored by us. 
And God, we just uh, dedicate this service to your name and your glory. In the powerful name of Jesus, amen. amen. Would you stand and sing with us? We're going to sing, uh, He Lives, lifting up this name of Jesus who's alive and well today. I serve the reason.
Well, amen. Praise God. What a beautiful day he's blessed us with. What a day of celebration. And even if it was pouring down rain, wouldn't it still be a beautiful day knowing that Jesus is out of the tomb? Well, we have an opportunity now that we're going to worship our God through our giving. And as we do that, I just want to challenge each of you to focus in your mind about what today is about. Focus on what it is that you are giving back to God for. Why are you doing that? 
I hope it's with a joyful heart that you're giving back to him because of all that he's done for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what an awesome day. We can stand here and celebrate because your son was victorious. Defeated sin and death once and for all. The tomb was empty. We're grateful for that. So Lord, as we take this opportunity to worship you through our giving, my prayer is that you're honored, you're uplifted and glorified, and that our hearts are focused on you. And we're going to give you the praise, honor, and glory in Christ's precious name. service and the children ages four through kindergarten may join their teacher and be dismissed for children's church. This morning's reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 8 to 12. Again, the passage today is 2 Timothy verses from chapter
by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until the day which has been entrusted to me. Thank you, Michelle. Get organized here for you. Well, good morning. Good morning. How is everybody? Great. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. Are you excited for today? Yes. Folks, you know, we celebrate Christmas and we, we celebrate these different holidays during the year, but this is the climax. This is the climax that we have as Christians. This is what it's all about. Without the resurrection, we're not here with hope today, are we? Amen. Well, my prayer today is that you're blessed and you walk out and away from here saying, it was good to be here today and study under the word of the Lord. Well, I want to start this morning with a question for you. How many of you either have or are right now part of an athletic team or athletics in general? Anybody out here? All right, I see a bunch of hands out there. Well, perhaps you play football, basketball, baseball, softball, something. Another, yeah, track, any, any kind of an event. And, and if you have, it's likely that you receive some encouragement from your coach. Now before a game as you prepare to go on the court or you, or you run on the field, your coach generally would gather you together, give you a motivational speech. Maybe he reminded you to remember the fundamentals. Remember what we practiced all week. We had a great bunch of practices this week. We're ready to go. We're getting fired up. You guys are better than the competition because you want it more. All right, and we all put our hands in the middle and we go, let's go, and we go out there charging with adrenaline, rushing, rushing, rushing through our veins. Now, over the years of my life, I've been a part of uh, some teams as well as I've observed teams that are clearly inferior, but they end up winners. They didn't have the physical talent or abilities of their opponents, but yet they emerged victorious. And I've also watched this happen many, many times. Perhaps some of you remember, and I know I'm dating myself here, but perhaps some of you, when I was a kid, I remember the U.S. hockey team. A bunch of college kids going up against a superior bunch of professionals from the USSR. And guess what? USA! We won! Against all odds, they, we were told that it was impossible to beat the professionals because that's all they did. And yet, guess what? We won the gold medal. And, you know, it, it's been said that when the 64 teams get together for the, for the uh, NCAA basketball tournament, that a lot of the games are won and lost, not based off the teams as much as the coaches and their ability to motivate those kids and convince them to do more than they know how to do in and of themselves or they think they can do. You know, they talk about the great Bobby Knight and some of these other coaches, how some of the games they won, they had no business winning. But it was the coach that took them through. And a lot of times when people are picking the brackets, when you have fun, you know, and you, you pick those brackets, a lot of times what they do is they look at the coach first. If you really know what you're doing and you say, you know what, those first few rounds, the coach makes the difference. And conversely, other coaches that struggle, 
They may come in with a superior skilled and talented team and they fall short. And I've seen that happen many times as well. Uh, so when, when, when we do those kinds of motivations, we can convince people to do a lot of things. Well, in our passage this morning, which we just heard read by Michelle, Paul offers some words of encouragement to Timothy. In fact, one theologian noted that if we were to summarize the passage in one statement, it might be this. Timothy, strengthen your resolve. As we examine the passage in more detail, however, we're going to see that unlike the motivational speeches and encouragement offered by many coaches to their athletic teams, Paul provides a very different form of motivation for Timothy as he encourages him in his ministry in the church at Ephesus. And we're going we're gonna to step through that, and I'm going to ask you at the end if you saw the difference. But before we look into this and we see Paul's charge here, which I would ask that you pause with me. Let's ask God to guide us through this journey this morning. Father, we're so grateful that we can come here today. We can celebrate Easter Sunday, the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. After all he went through, the victory in the end was far greater than any other thing. And it brought hope. It brought peace in the midst of the storm. And it brought great joy. And above all else, it brought reconciliation between the Creator and the creation. We are so thankful for that. And Lord, I would ask that this morning as we look at your word, guide us, strengthen and encourage us. Help us to see what you would have us to take from this, that we can apply it to our lives so that we might better serve you, love you more, and be a light to this world. And we're going to give you the glory in Christ's name. Well, the first charge that Paul gave to Timothy was to remember the commitment of our confession. In other words, remain committed and do not become ashamed of or regretful of our confession. Look with me, if you will, again at verse 8. It says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. So Paul begins the passage of Scripture with the word, therefore. Now remember that whenever we see the word therefore, we have to look to see why therefore is therefore, right? In other words, the verse could read like this, Timothy, because of what I just told you, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me as prisoner. Now, if you were with us last week, you heard my brother Anders speak about the previous verses where Paul was encouraging Timothy, fan the embers of the gift God has given him until it burst into a bright and roaring flame. Additionally, he reminded Timothy that God didn't give him a spirit of fear, but rather a power of love and of self-control. Now, with this in mind, Paul's charge to Timothy here was to not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. Now, the word used here is maturion. It's the Greek word maturion, which means a testimony or a witness. Now, while this could refer to just the preaching of the gospel, in light of the additional comments made by Paul, where he says, nor of me his prisoner, but share in the suffering for the gospel, it's logical to conclude that Paul's use of the word maturion here includes the sacrificial nature of Christ's ministry, including his suffering on a cross as a basis of our faith and preaching. You see, Christ's testimony included his teachings, his living example, his surrendering of his life on a cross, which those who witnessed it understood firsthand the shame and humiliation that that cross represented. Also included in his testimony, and definitely not to be forgotten or excluded, is the reason we celebrate today, his resurrection. Now, as we say amen and praise God when we talk about the beautiful message of the resurrection, I think it's important that we understand something, and we need to understand the view that was held by many in the region of Ephesus. You see, in first century Ephesus, where Timothy was ministering, um, they looked at life differently than we do. You see, there were a lot of Greek philosophers, and we talked about that way back in the introduction of 1 Timothy in the letter. We talked about the region in Ephesus where Timothy was, and Plato had a huge influence in that time. You see, Plato 
taught, his way of thinking was that tangible matter was something to be despised. The physical flesh was something to be despised. And they reasoned that purity was found only in ideas and thoughts. It was their belief that as humans were trapped in a matter-filled prison. And that death was a way to be freed from the prison and to allow our minds to ultimately go to our true home of matterless ideas. So, from a Greek perspective and way of thinking, the notion of being reunited with the body at the resurrection, that was a deplorable thought for them. Knowing that Timothy was was declaring a message that included the resurrection, Paul's encouragement for Timothy was not to allow their ridicule or disdain for the gospel cause him to be ashamed or be discouraged of the testimony of Jesus Christ, the full testimony, uncompromised. Additionally, we know that Paul's resolve to not be ashamed of Christ's testimony is something that he personally held very strongly. He wasn't saying, Timothy, do as I say and not as I do. No, that's not what he said, because if we go back to the book of Romans, here's what Paul had to say about that in verse 116. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul was proud of his faith. He was proud of who he was, and he certainly wasn't ashamed. And that's why he stood there and he encouraged Timothy, don't be ashamed of the gospel. And notice that Paul's confidence stemmed from the fact that the gospel was the power of God. Now think about that and keep that in your mind. Is the power of God alone to bring about salvation. And not works, not value, not accomplishments that come from any man. Paul understood that when God was in full control of any situation, and there was no, depend upon, no dependence upon the merits or the goodness of mankind, then success was guaranteed. Paul drew upon this truth as his source of confidence because of that great confidence he could declare for himself as well as encourage other believers, never be ashamed because God has never failed in fulfilling his promises. Amen. In order to understand the full magnitude of Paul's charge to Timothy and the commitment that Paul held for it, we must also remind ourselves of the situation that Paul was currently facing. You see, a few weeks ago as we looked at the introduction to the book of 2 Timothy, we talked about this. We, it's believed that this is the last letter that Paul wrote before his death. And certainly it's the last letter we have of Paul in the Bible. Paul had suffered many imprisonments, beatings, shipwreck, and certainly much scorn for the message that he carried to the people during his missionary journeys. He believed that his life was going to be taken in the very near future of this letter being written. From the eyes of the world, if anyone had a reason to consider being ashamed or beaten down for spreading the testimony of Christ, it was Paul. He knew, however, that Jesus himself had told his disciples they would suffer the hatred of the world because of their faith in him. We see in John 15, 18, 25, we see that very thing that, that Christ explained that. The Bible tells us that we should not be caught off guard by this reality. It shouldn't surprise us that the world is against us when we are for Christ. 1 Peter 4, 12-13 reminds us of this. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. Amen? So when Paul charged Timothy, do not be ashamed, it is not a message of surrender to defeat. That's not what he's telling him. It's a bold expression of ultimate victory that puts into practice what Paul expressed in Romans 8. Verse 18, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Folks, no amount of suffering or pain on this earth will ever compare to the glory that awaits every believer in the end. Like Paul and Timothy, who were boldly 
going before us and proclaiming the gospel, we too must carry the torch and unashamedly hold firm to the commitment of our confession. Well, the next thing that Paul charges Timothy with is to remember the contents of our confession. The second part of verse 8 said, But share in the sufferings for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace, which He gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. In these verses, Paul gives Timothy no less than four encouraging truths, which he should hold confidently to when proclaiming the testimony of Jesus. And the first encouraging truth that Paul provides for us for our confession is this, God's saving grace. God's saving grace. Our salvation is not dependent upon our goodness. It's not dependent upon our reputation or our personal efforts. Especially when it comes to upholding God's standards. It is God who provides every believer with the gift of salvation by His grace alone. Paul made this clear as he noted, not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace. Timothy's confession, like ours today, is not something that is impacted or made more or less real based on our efforts or the opinions of others. We all fail to live up to God's perfect standards of sinlessness. Paul reminded us of this in Romans 3.23 when he said, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Thankfully, our failures don't determine the results of our eternal destination. Amen? It's God's gift of salvation. It's made available by the death, the burial, and yes, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's where we anchor ourselves to. That's where our testimony holds firm to the rock. We can stand firm and unashamed of the gospel message because it is God who provides us with salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. The second encouraging truth that Paul provides us for our confession is God's holy calling in our lives. We're called with a holy calling from God himself, not by men. Verse 9, the first part of it says, Who saved us and called us to a holy calling. Folks, our standing before God is something that God holds in His hand. And nothing that He holds in His hand has ever been lost. He protects us. And it's never been stolen away. And we can be assured that it never will be stolen away. The world may scorn us, may ridicule our confession. But nothing they say or do can change God's decision regarding our eternal destination. It wasn't men who called us to the confession. It was a holy God. Men consistently change their minds and fail to deliver on promises, don't they? We see it all the time. The standards change based on the, the whims of the culture that we're in. Changing of the times. You've got to get with the times, right? God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. His standards never change. Only God can make that claim. It is this unchanging, steadfast God that has called us. This truth should energize every believer in Jesus Christ to stand firm in their faith and shout, Amen! Amen! The third encouraging truth that Paul provides us for our confession is God's eternal purpose. Paul states in the second half of verse 9, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. You see, salvation was always in God's plan before he created anything. The testimony of Christ was in play before, the, before one rock or one tree was ever formed. Adam's sin didn't catch God off guard and force him to develop a contingency plan. It was God's plan to provide us was salvation by grace through faith in Christ before the ages began. God knew that salvation for mankind would require that God the Son, Jesus the Messiah, would have to leave heaven, take on flesh and blood, and suffer even to the point of death on a cross in order to provide a way of reconciliation between the Creator and the creation. 
Having dealt the ultimate blow to sin and death through the glorious resurrection, Jesus fulfilled God's perfect plan of salvation, which was in play before the ages began. Think with me for just a moment about the implications of this truth. I want you to, to take a mental trip with me. God knew before he created any of us that we would rebel and sin against him. He knew that already. And it would cause death and a separation between us and him. And it would alienate and make disgusting the perfect creation which he saw that was very good. Knowing that, he lovingly went ahead and created us anyway. He knew we would reject and despise him. And he went forth with the creation anyway. That's pretty humbling. That, my friends, is an amazing demonstration of love. How many of you here today, if you had the power to create, would create something that you knew would rebel against you and require the life of your child in order to restore that relationship? It would be an extremely difficult at best and more likely impossible for any of us to do. That, my friends, is exactly what God did for you and for me. He has an eternal purpose that was set forth before the ages began, and nothing or no one is going to alter or prevent him from accomplishing that per per perfect purpose in the end. If this were the only reason for us to not be ashamed and remain steadfast upon our confession, it would be enough. But it's one of multiple reasons Paul provided to Timothy to encourage him to stand firm. We have even more than that. Praise God. And the fourth encouraging truth that Paul provides us for our confession is this. God's assured outcome. The testimony of Christ, which Paul called Timothy to remain unashamed of, results in the greatest possible and most perfect outcome ever. It is, in fact, the reason we're here celebrating Easter today. You see, God's plan of salvation that we just noted was in place before the ages began. His plan included the devastatingly cruel and inhumane death of Jesus on the, on the cross. The events we examined on Friday evening during our Good Friday service. Remember how we left that service with a heavy heart and a somber mood? Think back just a day or two. Even though we have the ability to view the cross from the other side of history knowing the full story, our hearts and souls felt an ache as we heard the story of the cruelty and pain that Jesus endured leading up to and including his death. Imagine what those who were there on the very day that witnessed Jesus' actual crucifixion, what they felt firsthand that day. You, saw, you see, even though Jesus told many of them that he would rise again on the third day, they didn't understand it completely, and they couldn't fully grasp the moment. What they saw... But, praise God, that wasn't the end. Look with me at Paul's words in verse 10. Look what he says there. He says, And which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. You see, Christ's death on the cross wasn't a final chapter to God's plan of salvation. That wasn't all there was. Jesus Christ rose from the dead once for all, destroying the power of sin and death and replacing it with life immortal for those who by faith accept the gift that cost him everything so that we might be reconciled to God. Jesus Christ provided firsthand assurance regarding the outcome of placing our faith in him. The tomb was empty. We find confirmation of this in Matthew 28, verses 5 and 6. It says, But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. And here it is. He's not here. 
For he is risen, as he said, come see the place where he lay. Folks, the stone wasn't a, a rolled away from the tomb for Jesus to come out. It was rolled away so that we could see that he wasn't there anymore. Paul's message to Timothy and to us is that any pain, any discomfort or suffering that we endure in this life is nothing when compared to the final outcome that awaits God's faithful children. When we hold fast to this truth, there is nothing that anyone can say or do to us that could ever cause us to be ashamed. We must remember the contents of our confession. Well, the final thing in our passage today that Paul charges Timothy with is to remember the confidence of our confession. Verse 11 says, For which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher. Let's stop there for just a minute. And, and here Paul reminds Timothy that he had a personal connection to the gospel message of Christ, specifically that he was appointed as a preacher, apostle, and teacher of that gospel. Now, the Greek word for preacher is kerex. This means a herald, an envoy, or a proclaimer. The Greek word for apostle is apostolos, which means one sent out or a messenger. And finally, the Greek word for teacher is didaskalos, which means an instructor. In other words, Paul was called by Jesus to be a herald, a messenger sent out, and an instructor of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It came, however, with additional information. First part of verse 12 says, which is why I suffer as I do. So because of these things that he was appointed to and what he did with them faithfully, he suffered for those things. You see, from the very early beginnings of his ministry, God made it known to Paul that he would endure suffering for his efforts. Shortly after Paul's first encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, Jesus told Ananias the following about Paul. In Acts chapter 9, this is what he told Ananias. He says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And here it is. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Now, looking over the accounts of Paul's ministry as provided to us in the New Testament, we see that he did indeed experience much suffering, including being stoned and left for dead outside the city of Lystra. And even now, at the writing of this letter, Paul was sitting in prison cell awaiting his execution. Would it be today? Would it be tomorrow? He didn't know, but it would be soon. From merely an outside worldly view into Paul's life, he had more than enough reasons to be discouraged and ashamed of the gospel message of Christ, which he suffered for as he proclaimed it. Paul, however, had this to say. Second part of verse 12. But I am not ashamed. Then he continued to explain the reason for his steadfastness. He says, For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Now the New American Standard translation reads this way. It says, For I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to protect that which I have entrusted to him until that day. So in one case it's translated, what has been entrusted to me, and the other translation says, what I have entrusted to him. Now a, little, a literal translation of the Greek that Paul used here would be, my entrustment. Now this can mean either that which I have been entrusted with, or what I have entrusted to him. Rather than hold firmly to one translation over the other, here's what Swindoll suggests. He suggests that Paul may have purposely left it ambiguous with a double meaning to include both the treasure of the gospel that God entrusted to Paul, as well as Paul's soul, which he entrusted to God. In both cases, God has absolutely proven his ability to guard and protect those two things. Paul's challenge to Timothy and to us is that knowing the steadfast, reliable, unblemished ability of God to deliver on all his promises over and above anything this world might say or do in opposition, we 
must look at the evidence and then declare our commitment to God's truth and never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Given the choice between a God who has never, ever, 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 ever continue on, failed to deliver on his promises and commitments, given the choice between that and the world with all its empty promises and lies, how can you even hesitate to stand confident and unashamed in anything other than the gospel message? If Paul could maintain such confidence in light of all that he endured during his ministry, then certainly Timothy, as well as you and I, can do the same. We must remember the confidence of our confession. Well, as Paul's sufferings increased and the impending moment of his execution drew nearer, his resolve grew stronger. His attitude and approach to his calling was unwavering in the face of incredible opposition and reproach, even including his own death. In his life, we see that he maintained a positive attitude. We see also that he drew upon the spiritual strength that had grown increasingly stronger throughout his ministry years. He clearly understood and expected to suffer for his efforts, but his resolute commitment to Christ and courage as he faced certain death came from submitting everything he had to God. It was God who provided him with everything he needed to overcome. Anything this world could throw at him, he knew God was more than sufficient. This strength and determination provided by God is what charged Timothy, what he charged Timothy to draw upon his ministry in Ephesus. It wasn't pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Do it in your own strength. He said, no. You want strength? Surrender yourself and submit to God. Let his strength and his power lead out and you will be victorious. Stand firm in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't rely on your own strengths. Just the opposite of what we talked about at the beginning when I started this. The coaches would always tell you, you're better, you've got this, you've trained harder, you've done all this. But you know what Paul told Timothy? Throw that stuff away when it comes to the things of God and trust in Him and rely on His strength and His power because it will never fail. We can stand unashamed of the gospel because God has proven Himself willing and able to provide us a means necessary to be successful and to guard and protect all that has been entrusted to us and that we have entrusted to Him. He has accomplished all these things without ever stumbling, ever failing in any way to fulfill one single commitment. Believer, are you struggling with your walk with Christ? Do you find yourself ashamed of the gospel when others ridicule or threaten you because of your faith in Jesus? I think if we're honest with ourselves, there are times in all of our lives when these thoughts and feelings try to creep in. In his second letter to Timothy, Paul gives us overwhelming encouragement that we must regularly remind ourselves with in order to stay the course and stand firm in the gospel. Knowing that it doesn't depend on our skills, our talents, and our abilities to be successful, but rather on God's unquestioned abilities, should encourage every believer, regardless of any situation this world can throw at you. The outcome is already determined, folks. Victory is assured. How can we not celebrate that? Remember, the tomb is empty. For those of you here this morning who haven't surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, let me ask you something. What is it that is causing you to hesitate and not place your trust in the only one who has proven to be able to provide everything he promised with absolute perfection? There's no fine print with God. There's no exceptions with God. What he says he will do, and he has done, and he will continue to do. There's no other source that can offer you a promise that carries a 100% promise of full and uncompromised delivery. God has never failed and by his very nature will never fail. Please don't walk away from here without 
taking the gift that he is offering you. You see, that gift cost everything that Jesus had to offer, even his life. But that debt covered your debt and my debt. And the gift is there for us, but folks, you cannot accept and, and enjoy a gift unless you come and you take it and you open it up and you use it. Otherwise, it's a gift that someone has purchased and it's sitting there unused and goes to waste. It, it rusts, it, it rots, it, it fades away, but it has no value if you don't accept it to you personally. Don't walk away today without knowing that the resurrected Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. If you want to know how to do that, come and talk to me. I would love the opportunity to just talk with you just for a few moments or come and talk with honors. If you're uncomfortable, if you're a lady, you can talk to my wife. She'd be happy to visit with you, but don't let pride or selfishness or embarrassment cause you to walk away from here today without accepting the greatest gift that has ever or ever will be made available to you. Heavenly Father, how can we not start our prayer without saying thank you? Thank you for so much. Thank you for, for everything in our daily lives, but especially thank you that Jesus Christ fulfilled your perfect plan, provided the perfect sacrifice on that deathly, horrible cross, shed his blood, and when they placed him in the tomb, they couldn't hold him back. He rose from the dead. He's seated at your right hand, and one day, We'll see you face to face if Christ is our Lord and Savior. We are so grateful for that. We praise you for this Easter Sunday in which we celebrate. We give you the honor. We give you the glory and the praise in Christ's name. Amen. Well, folks, <clears throat> this is a time in our service at the end where when we gather together, like those who gathered together in the first century, when they gathered together, they broke bread. They broke bread together, and the reason they did it is because Jesus spoke to them on the night before his betrayal. He was gathered in the upper room with the disciples. And here's what he did. He took a loaf of bread, he picked it up off the table, and he tore a piece of it, and he passed it around for each of them to tear a piece away from it. And he said, this is a representation of my body which is about to be broken for you because I love you. That's what his message was about love. My body to be broken for you. As often as you take of this bread, remember what it represents. And then after they had done that, he lifted up the cup from the fruit of the vine and he said, this is a representation of my blood. You see, God is clear through his message that without the shedding of of blood there is no forgiveness of sin and he said as often as you drink this remember that I shed my blood for you so that your sins could be covered so if you're here today and Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior this is a moment for you this is an opportunity for you to remember what Jesus did and put it all together. If you're here and you don't know the Lord, then I would encourage you not to go through some ritual. There's no special power or anything in it. it, it it's, it's there for those who trust in Christ to remember why they trust in Christ and what He did for them. If you don't know Him, let me encourage you to take this time. Don't be ashamed or feel like you have to get up because of peer pressure or anything else. Nobody's going to say anything or think anything. Take this time to ask yourself, why don't I know Jesus as my Lord and Savior? What's, what's holding you back? Ask Him to lead and guide you during this time of reflection. 
So at this time, what I'm going to ask is if some of you guys about halfway back will you come up to the front and take the cup and those half in the back would back in the back. There's a table where you can take that cup. Go back to your seat. When you're ready to take those elements, go ahead and just take them in your own time. And we're going to give God the glory. So if you will, at this time, I'll, I'll pray. And then if you want to get up and come and get the elements, you can do that. Father, again, we say thank you. As we remember back the cruelty that your son suffered. But you knew the rest of the story. You knew that it was for a far, far, far greater outcome than the world intended as they nailed him to that cross. You knew full well that your son would rise up from the dead and would be seated at your right hand in glory. And we're grateful for that. So as we partake of this, Lord, I ask that you would help us to remember all that took place so that we might have a relationship with you. And we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in Christ's name. Amen. Invite my choir to come back up here and lead us here at the end. What a glorious day. Amen. What a great day to celebrate. And because Jesus is alive, our lives are worth living. Right? We know who holds the future. So stand with us if you would, and we're going to sing Because He Lives as our way of going out.
Well, God bless you all. Thank you for being here. I trust that uh, this day has been a glorious day to be here and to hear the preached word of God and, and to know that he is able. He's risen. Amen. Amen. God bless you all and have a great day.